if you think of this experience of life, or ultimately this game of life, right? A key perspective that can bring up a lot of information when it comes to living your goals, what's authentic, what's my purpose, is even viewing life as a video game, right? What if life were a video game? Well, if this was a video game, how would you live it? So that when you were to return the game, return the game of life, you would look back at your experience and be proud. And there wouldn't be any, I just need a little bit more time to, you'd be like, you know what? I played it and I played it my way. Think of your life, how you're living it. If you were to return the game of life right now, how would you feel about it? Would you be proud of the life you lived? Proud of the person you were, the impact you had? Or are there perhaps some regrets, some things you've been putting off, holding back on, like one day, someday, I really gotta, I should, I oughta. Things you know you just should be doing, but for some reason you're not. Or perhaps even some goals or dreams that you've been holding back on. Maybe they're a little too big for you, a little scary. Well, guess what? Cheesy as it sounds, dream big. It's crazy how people will ugh, like be their own ultimately stifling parent. I have clients do this in my coaching. I'm like, write down your ideal life. What are some of your goals? Say everything went perfectly well the next five years. What would that look like? Think about it, all of you. Next five years, if everything went perfectly according to plan, where are you? I don't really know. Or people try to play small. I guess I'm here. I don't want to write that because it sounds unrealistic. I don't want it to sound unrealistic. Well, yes, some things could sound unrealistic. If your goal in the next five years is, I'm flying on a unicorn, that's unrealistic. <laughs> but in terms of, you know, following the laws of physics, you could say, in the real world, like, don't play small on your goals. It's funny how as a kid, you ask a, a kid, what do you want to do when, you're, when you grow up? All of you had an answer. And you dream big. You're like, I want to be an astronaut. I want this. Like, you allowed yourself to dream. And then what happened? Grown-ups and people started telling you, you need to be more serious with your goals. Those goals are a little childish, a little too big. How crazy it is to say to someone, like, your goals are a little too big. Bring them down a bit. Play a little smaller. Yet that's the conditioning. You got to stop dreaming. You got to start taking yourself seriously. I remember having a lot of people tell me that, even my own parents. I had dreams, crazy dreams. If you're familiar with my story, I'm originally from Switzerland, by the way, grew up in a small farm town of 650 people. I believe now it's a little bit over 700 people, but that's it. Literally, small farm town, Switzerland. No one makes it out of Switzerland except for Roger Federer. <laughs> but literally, it's like, who comes from Switzerland? Roger Federer and Julien Blanc. But no one makes it out. Literally, the dream of, oh, you know, I wish I could travel and experience this and do this. Uh, growing up, I always wanted to do um, music, be a rock star. That was my dream from a young age, for real. Played the guitar from the age of eight, 12, started a band with a friend, composed nonstop, and that's originally why I moved to Los Angeles. You think people in Switzerland were like, yes, you're going to make it. You're the next big talent. You have what it takes. No. Because not only was I from Switzerland, but I was so shy. I had anxiety around family members. I had anxiety around dinner. Dinner with my parents, my sister, my brother. I was like, oh, it's dinner time. I got to go out of my room. Like, I was that awkward kid. And you'd just be like, ugh. Like, it was terrible. But I could express myself through playing the guitar. So I couldn't verbally, but I could do it through music. And that's also what just had such an appeal. And I didn't have many friends. I still had a few, right? The friend I did music with. But if you logically just looked at the situation, you would have probably told me, yeah, maybe it's time to grow up and be more realistic. That was cute when you were younger. It's no longer cute anymore. Now, fortunately, though, my grandmother never said that to me. She was actually one of the only people in my family who always supported it. She's a little out there. We've been on good terms and bad terms. But growing up when I was young, we were on very good terms. And she kept saying, oh, you're so talented. Yes, you can do it. Yes, and would always encourage any goal. And she would do that with all of us. Like all the grandkids, whatever the goals was, she was just always about it. She never said, what? 
Like even drawing. I remember I would um, draw, and I was pretty good at drawing, but I would draw a little, uh, I don't know, a little character on a napkin at a restaurant, right, or on the placemat, like as a kid. And she would literally say, put the date under that and sign it. And I'll keep it for when you're famous. And literally rip off the little thing, and guess what? She still has them. No joke, she gave them to me uh, a few months ago. She's like, here's this box with these things. There were some of those little things she kept. Now, just think externally the impact that it has. It's like someone believing in you. And for a lot of people, that's also what's missing. It's like, who in your life truly believes in you? Bless you. Right? Gesundheit. Um, right? And sometimes that's all it takes. It's a cheesy saying, but you can write this down. Sometimes all it takes is just one person to believe in you. Because oftentimes, it's just you with yourself, and that's already hard enough to believe in you. And you look around, and everyone's looking down. They might have this preconceived image of who you are. They're like, ah, it's just not you. But say someone's like, yes, I believe you got this. And you're like, they see some of that in me? They see some greatness in me? And maybe times where you don't even see it in yourself, that can make a huge difference. So for all of you here, when it comes to the way you live life, or your purpose, or your dreams, what would you dream if you could dream big? What would that look like? Now, does that mean you're going to make it? Not necessarily. But, and I would write this down too, I would rather fail than wonder. That's kind of my motto. For me from Switzerland, I quit university. So I was going to university, business, HEC, Lausanne. And uh, I quit and I moved to LA to pursue music. That's why I originally moved to LA. Now, from my parents' perspective, they want to keep me safe. They love me, but say I'm your kid and I come up to you and I'm like, hey, so I'm quitting university and I'm moving to LA to do some music. Do you have a plan? Nah. I'm just going to wing it. So they were not happy about it. But for me, it was something I had to do. And I sat down and I ultimately made this pact or agreement with myself, which was, it's possible that you don't make it. So moving there, I knew it's possible that I never make it. I move there, I have this dream of being this musician or rock star, and I fail, and I just work just entry-level jobs, and I might even be homeless, and that's just going to be the rest of my life. And then I followed it up with, is it still worth it? And the answer was yes. I would rather do that thing I love than not do it. And it's the same with purpose. Remember this, you're still going to have bad days on your purpose. I would rather have a bad day doing something I love than a good day doing something I don't. And that was the comfort that Switzerland provided. It's like, okay, finish university, and literally it opens all these avenues of jobs and stuff, but nothing just lit my soul up. Nothing excited me. Nothing just gave me that spark of life. And I'd just be going through the motions, and when I returned the game of life, I'm like, eh, how was it? Pretty boring game. Yeah, it was safe, but that too, with safety comes boredom. Yeah, I was gonna, didn't really take any risks. Did you follow your dreams? Did you play the way you wanted to? No, but I made my parents proud. I made society proud. I made, I made the, the, the people in the game proud. But what about you? So I'd rather find out. I'm not doing music, <laughs> but what am I doing? Technically the same thing. And this is what I would also ask you to do is, Look at your dream, like so for me, music, rock star, etc. but then look at the components of that, saying what about that is actually so fulfilling to me? Because guess what? You could think of this here as the concert. You could think of the videos I post online as the recorded songs. You could think of the content creation that also comes from coaching and finding the best ways to explain things as the composing of the music. So it's the exact same underlying needs that are being met. And that applies to all of you. That dream you have, what about it? What are the components? Maybe you have two dreams. You're like, I don't know. Well, what are the components of the two? And can you find something that encompasses the two? And then the cheesy story is if you believe it, sometimes you can do it. Now, does it come with challenges? Yeah. My whole journey has been tons of challenges, ups and downs. Like I said, moving to LA wasn't comfortable. It was two years of working dead-end jobs, almost being homeless, breaking down in tears and almost giving up. Then making something work, starting to coach and travel around and have all that crash and burn. You know, it was like over $200,000 in debt. Almost killed myself, didn't, but almost. Like tons of ups and downs. But ultimately, that's also the price you pay. 
It's like, look, risk is, is part of life regardless. But the scariest type of risk is the kind that sneaks up on you. The kind that where you're just kind of sitting, going through the motions, and you think you're remaining the same, you're not. You're either moving up or you're moving down. You stay in your comfort zone, you become more entrenched in your comfort zone. It traps you even more. It's actually, it's actually going down, but you don't realize it. It's like, uh, what is it, if you put a, a frog in a pot and you start boiling the pot, it's like a slow boil. That's the scary risk. And then people realize it's too late. With age, it doesn't get easier either. You get more tired. <laughs> you don't have as much energy. It's a lot harder. You have to be more on top of certain things. There's more responsibility. It doesn't get easier. You're like, one day? That's like saying, I'm going to purposely make it harder. That's waiting for one day. And then realize the ups and downs is also what makes this interesting. If you watch some crazy movie, you don't want a movie where, one, everything goes perfect. It's like, the hero starts and succeeds and succeeds and succeeds the end. <laughs> Boring. Or the hero starts and sits in his room and does not leave his room and is very comfortable and eats and sleeps. The end. And part of us even watching those crazy movies and the adventure, the risk, or the action, you can always say what you resonate with out here usually gives you signs of what's in here. It means a part of you is probably craving that in your life. You don't have to go extreme. We all have different goals and dreams, but welcome some of that. And also welcome the bad times in life. If everything went perfectly well, you'd be in a state of apathy. Back to viewing life as a video game, it'd be like playing a video game on God mode. How boring is that? Now, if you've been struggling in life, it might sound appealing, but you do that a little bit, you're going to get bored after. So you want the ups and downs. And here's the thing, nothing's permanent and everything comes in waves. If you're having a great time right now in life and things are just aligned and great, bad times are coming. All of us are going to experience terrible times between now and the day we die, unless we die sooner. If you're in a bad time right now, that means good times are coming. <laughs> For real, it's like nothing stays the same. It's like these waves. And the same is with letting go and emotions. How we're like, I only want to feel the good emotions, not the bad ones. Same with life. I only want things to go according to my plan. What if you were to just embrace it all? And also, with adversity and things not going according to your plan, the question I always ask myself is, how do you know that your plan is the best plan? Right? Think of life, too. Here's another perspective. Think of life as a parent. And you are a child, and you're sitting down, and you're hungry. And what do you want to eat? Candy, ice cream, McDonald's, and a ton of sugar. Sugary syrup. And that's all on your plate, and you're just chugging it. Now, what might your parent do? Everyone's like, that does sound pretty good. Say a, your parent might come to you and say, okay, you've had enough of that. Here's some broccoli. How are you going to react as a kid? All that sugary goodness taken away, and you have this plate of broccoli. Wah! You're going to throw a tantrum. Funny enough, that's how a lot of us react to adversity in life. Here's my plan. For you as a kid, you think the best plan for you is the sugary syrup. Then your parents are like, no. And then you realize later on, hey, thanks. If I just ate syrup every day, it wouldn't be good. Because you thought your plan was the best, but it wasn't because your perspective was limited as a child. What about here today? You want your life to go a certain way? You want this to happen? You want that to happen? You want it to look like this? And a life crisis or adversity is when life says, nope. Oh, that's where you want to go? Nope. And you hit a wall. And just like a kid, most of us cry and throw a tantrum. Why? It's so unfair. Ugh, life's so mean, feeding me broccoli. But then ask yourself, well, what if there's a better plan? What if what I thought was best for me wasn't? Then you can think of the classic situations where people might get fired, and it's like, I'm losing, I got fired. Why? And then later on, they find a better job. Have you heard of situations like this, maybe even yourself? Yeah, yeah. and you wouldn't have even found that better job if you didn't get fired. So there actually was a better plan. So technically, succeeding or failing is very nuanced. Because you could argue you getting fired, failing, is actually you succeeding in the long run. So by failing, you're succeeding. You should be celebrating as you're getting fired because that's what allows you to get the new job. If you didn't get fired, you'd still be stuck in the same job. The same with a breakup. How often do you hear that? I broke up. And then you find someone even better and you're happy that the, broke up, the breakup happened. 
So technically, breaking up is you succeeding. You should be like, yes. You don't know. Now, does that mean have no plan? Of course not. Have a plan, best you can. But when life does get in the way and there's nothing you can do about it, be open to that better plan and look for it. And look for the, the lessons that adversity gives you. In spiritual work, when it comes to getting triggered, there's a key saying that says, don't fixate on the messenger. Look for the message. Meaning when a person or a situation triggers you, it's easy to just focus on the person. They triggered me. Life did this. That's unfair. But they were just the messenger. What's the message that got triggered? Same with adversity. Okay, it didn't go according to plan. Well, what can you learn from that? And then with any situation, you can always get better or bitter. Better or bitter. You can use it to go down, self-attack, self-pity, withdraw from life, resent life. Or you can use it to, huh, instead of hating life as a parent, what if life is actually on my side? If you knew for a fact, like say right now the universe, God, life, came to you and said, I'm on your side, passing a lie detector test, how would you experience adversity moving forward? You could argue a lot of that resisting of bad times is because you don't trust that life's on your side, you're unsure. Which also, the more you're a controlling person, the underlying fear is, I don't trust, I'm, I'm afraid that things won't go my way otherwise. You only have to control something you don't trust. Control life. If I don't do it, life's gonna screw me over. Control other people. It means you don't trust that other people have your own best interests at heart. I have to control myself. I don't trust myself. Controlling and trust, opposites. The more you need to control, the less you trust. Then you can also think in terms of blessings. There's the saying, blessings come in disguise. Have you heard this before? Yeah. Meaning, hey, if you want the blessing, you have to let it come to you in disguise. And how is it going to come to you in disguise? In the form of adversity, in the form of bad times. Welcome it. Say, maybe it's the disguise. And then the blessing's like, surprise, yes. And you're like, thank you, blessing, thank you. Now, in those hard times too, I've been through a lot. I would also say, yes, embrace it, remind yourself of this. But you can also use different perspectives or mindsets to help you temporarily. Even mindsets that seem out there. Meaning, when you're in a tough spot, use whatever helps you. In my darkest times, I relied on crazy out there perspectives. One was this whole idea of soul families. Anyone hear of this? Your soul family, right? Uh, very famous in the spiritual world where it kind of falls under the umbrella of things you forgot once you were born. Meaning there's this idea that your soul has a family with other souls before you're born. And you decide that, okay, we're all going to join Earth. We're all going to be born. And uh, we're all going to play crucial, pivotal roles in each other's lives. Meaning, like say it's us four here. I'm like, okay, we're all soul family. We're going to go down to Earth, but we're all going to forget it once we're born. But we're going to come up with a certain plan. You are going to screw me over and ruin my business. You are going to marry that person. And then you are going to go down in flames and we're all gonna to try to save you and you're gonna hate all of us the entire way through until the end where you realize this epiphany. And then we all are born. Now, this whole perspective can help because in those moments where even you're like, that person screwed me over, this person, my worst enemy, da da da. What if that worst enemy was actually your friend pre being born? Purposely saying, hey, let's be enemies just to learn certain experiences or lessons. Now again, is this true? Who knows? <laughs> Could be, but none of us can really know. But taking on this mindset, in a tough time, can be quite beneficial. Use what you can. Guess what? Another mindset that sounds a little dark that helped me, as I mentioned, I almost did end it um, when I was 26 years old. That's when everything crashed, went through this crazy worldwide scandal. One thing that actually kept me going was I didn't want to die when I was 26 because it's not a cool age. Yeah, it, it, it's for real. I, I was like, you know what? The rock star, again, me with the music, the rock star age to die is 27. So just make it another year, man. Come on. And that kept me going. And during that other year, I did more inner work, and then I came out of it. It's dark, but it's true. It's like, use whatever you can. You can also think, well, what if there's me here, back to the video game, there's the, the character that is me, 
but there's also the player that is me, my higher self, if you will. Can I, just taking on that perspective, it's not you alone, but what if there's this, this other higher self and just having someone on your back like that can also help tremendously. Also talking to people, surrounding yourself with people, but not any kind of people, people who take the charge out of it. Meaning there's two types of people. If you talk to about your problems, one person's like, say you're like, oh, here's my problem. I'll be like, oh, that's so bad. Ooh, oh no. How are you dealing with that? That's the worst thing I've heard. Oh, and, that, oh, and did you think of that too? And if that happens, then this may happen. And they fuel it. You'll see people thrive on this. They love gossip. They just add on to it. And then you'll see other people who take the charge out of it. Meaning they're still there for it. Like, oh, I'm sorry. But then they can bring you back to the present moment. They don't add the fucking like fuel to the fire. They're just like, hey, bring you back. Yes, that sucks. I'm here for you. It's going to be okay, etc. Talk to those people. Surround yourself with those people. Guess what? Hard times also shows you who those people are. You don't know who your true friends are until you go through hard times. In a relationship too. You don't know what your relationship is made of until you both go through really hard times. That brings out the truth. It'll show you very fast. So there is actually a gift when it comes to adversity. You know who's who. Otherwise you don't. It's easy to be friends when things are going well. We call this fair weather friends. When the weather's nice, it's easy to be friends. So welcome the rain. It also shows you how serious you are about what you're doing. For example, even your purpose, you want to be tested on that. It shows you, hey, how serious are you? Are you going to let the first little obstacle give up? There's also that saying, with big goals, you will be tested. How serious are you about those big goals? Keep on going. And oftentimes, too, in those moments where hard times hit, adversity hits, when you can't go on any further, it's usually links, and this is the whole get better, not bitter, to are you willing to let some of your ego die? That's a lot of it. To get better, you're going to have to leave some things behind there. Some old ways of being, how you view yourself, some old patterns, some old ways, uh, old ways of thinking. And it doesn't feel pleasant. It's, it's, it's not pleasant at all. Ego death. But that's what you have to go through. Are you going to keep doubling down on the same old strategy that got you here in the first place, or are things going to change? And that's sometimes what you need. If you think of even your journey in this whole self-help spiritual world, guaranteed for a lot of you, if not all of you, it's some kind of bad time that set you on this path. Something where you're like, you know what, enough's enough. I'm going to do something about this. Or it could be an accumulation of small ones and you just reach that tipping point where you're like, nope, we got to change. Otherwise, why would you even be open and willing and have the courage to dive into yourself to work on yourself? Notice how probably a lot of people in your life, even friends, family, acquaintances, you're like, hey, look at this. And are they as into it as you? Like, oh, what? Self-help, self-improvement, spiritual, why do you need that? Totally closed off. But you aren't. Why? Because you hit that tipping point. So a gift of hard times is actually that. So remember it, because hard times will come again. What's the lesson? What's the gift? How can I use this to get better, not bitter, so that when I look back, I can perhaps even be thankful that it happened. And then, just like playing a video game, it's what adds the contrast to life. And it's also what adds unique skills or insights into who you are. So one final perspective. For any of you who do play video games, I talk a lot about video games. I'm actually not that big of a video game player, but I just love comparing it to it. Sometimes you'll see these quests, so I've heard, where it's like, <laughs> it's like behind the scenes, but it's like, <sighs> I'm doing, like playing as I'm talking. So there's these quests here. Um, where you'll have to venture out and it's a difficult quest. So say you go up the mountain, down the stream, in the snow, you beat the ogre and on the other side you get the special crystal that gives your character super abilities. And it's a very rare crystal, very difficult to get. Many have perished. Right? Well, to get the special ability, you have to go through the toughest terrain, the toughest path where most people wouldn't. Think of hard times in life like that, taking risks in life. You do that, you get unique insights, skills, or abilities that most people don't have. If you act like everyone else, you're never going to stand out. You won't have those unique things. Like part of also why I'm able to talk about what I'm talking about and share this is 
I had such a crazy life and went down these crazy paths that I've had these scarce experiences that very few people have had, which leads to scarce lessons and knowledges and knowledge. The same on a business level, by the way. The more risks you take and the more you do things that are, say, hard to replicate, the more you're going to stand out. The higher, like the harder the barrier of entry, if you get in and you succeed, you have one up, right? Like just on a pure, say, sharing lessons or the way I do my business is, you know, I'm post, I do a little less now, but in the past I would post a lot of out in the streets in different cities, um, just videos. So it's like, hey, I'm in Berlin. Hey, I'm in Vienna. Hey, I'm in this city. And it's me around the world doing this, sharing lessons. I could easily just do it from the comfort of my home. Hey, it's me on my couch. Here's the lesson. And that's what most people do. But because I did it in all those cities around the world, it's something unique. It's hard to replicate. Values stand out. The same with seminars. Anything that's hard to replicate. The same with difficult experiences in life. It's not fun, but if it's one that very few people have, there's something valuable in there, and you just got to find it.